Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rowena Hume, and I'm the General Manager for Insight and Communications at Beef and Lamb. So I'm going to be facilitating today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, before I go, um, go through the purpose and the agenda, I just have got a couple of housekeeping um, rules. So today's webinar is being recorded um, and we'll be sharing it as well. Um, just for um, internet connectivity and everything, we just ask that people turn off their cameras and their microphones um, just so that we can kind of um, make sure we've got a lot to get through in an hour. So we're just going to um, do that. Thank you very much. I saw somebody <laughs> click off then. Um, please write your questions. There will be times for questions. Put them in the Q&A box that should be um, showing up. If the Q&A box isn't showing up, we'll be fixing that in a minute. So the purpose of today's webinar is to hear more about a report that Beef and Lamb commissioned that looked at the national bottom lines for sediment, E. coli and phosphorus. The reason we commissioned this report is that we started to see some concerning things come from regional council's um, plans about how much sediment and E. coli would need to be reduced by in order to meet the national bottom lines and the rules that could potentially be introduced to meet them. And being Beef and Lamb is very much an evidence-based organisation, so we therefore commissioned a report to understand how the bottom lines were set and to model what actions farmers would need to take to meet them. So today we're going to take you through that report, um, explain its findings, the economic and policy implications of those findings and answer any technical questions. We'll first hear from Paul Lemire, who is the Senior Manager for Environment Policy at Beef and Lamb New Zealand. But Paul's going to provide a high-level introduction to the Freshwater National Policy Statement and the National Bottom Lines Framework. Then we're going to hear from Dr Michael Greer, who is a Principal Freshwater Scientist at Toulouse Environment, and he wrote the report. Michael is a leading freshwater scientist with over 13 years experience and has worked for NIWA, DOC, Greater Wellington Regional Council and ECAN. We'll then hear again from Paul about the policy and economic implications of the rules and then we'll open up to questions and answers. Um, just before we kick off, I, I really do want to emphasise that we absolutely recognise that sheep and beef farming does cause sediment and E. coli issues and that these are issues that need to be managed. So for us, it's about, you know, what is the best way to achieve that? And on that note, I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you, Rina. Just share my screen. So I'm just going to um, spend a, a little bit of time going through um, uh, a bit of a scene setting thing around the MPS. We've also got lots of different people on here from different with different knowledge about the MPS and what we're talking about today. So before I deep dive uh, into it, particularly Michael's work, uh, I'll just go through some of that scene setting uh, concept. So the MPS, uh, the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management, or the MPS FM as we call it, is a high level RMA regulation that sets a framework and a process for regional councils to follow to achieve community values and goals for water quality. The MPS also sets national bottom lines for different attributes and attributes are things that you can measure in the water such as sediment, phosphorus, nitrogen, etc. And these national bottom lines must be achieved. And the MPS uh, regional councils have to set water quality targets, limits, timeframes and rules to meet the national bottom lines and also other community values and goals. But this process often has moved away from being outcome driven and becoming very number myopic. So I'm trying to explain um, <laughs> simplistically here what goes on within uh, grading uh, a region's rivers um, and using the tables within the MPS. So councils grade the rivers in a region to bands based on the attribute tables in the MPS, which go from A to D for most attributes and sort of excellent to poor. Um, and here's a sort of hypothetical for spending fine sediment and E. coli with the proportions of each for uh, a hypothetical region. So suspended fine sediment is measured by visual clarity, and there's four different river types within the table. But for one of those, if you're on an A band, if you have greater than 1.7 meters, for example, of visual clarity, and you're on a D band, if you're less than 1.3 meters. So you work through the region and work out where all your rivers are. E. coli in the bottom ribbon there is done a different way. Um, there's four different ways of measuring it. You can do percentage exceedances of different concentrations of two different concentrations, the median concentration and the 95th percentile. And whichever those four different ways 
you measure the lowest grade is the grade for that river, basically. Importantly, within the MPS, you then have to, if you're below a bottom line, so in that top fine sediment ribbon, you can see if you're in a D band, you're below a national bottom line, you must improve above that D band. If you're in a C or B band, you can improve or maintain, depending on what the community wants. Once you've gone through the process, if you're in an A band, you need to improve. E. coli is different. Um, you have to improve unless you're in the A band, basically. So E. coli doesn't have a national bottom line as such, but it has sort of pseudo bottom lines because every grade of river is in, it has to improve above that, basically. So from beef and land work in the uh, regions, looking in planning process, such as plan change one, et cetera, became pretty apparent, as Rose said, that some of these national bottom lines look very unachievable and problematic for sheep and beef farmers. So beef and land commissioned uh, an external expert, Dr. Greer, in this case, to review the NPS's national bottom lines for attributes such as spend defined sediment and E. coli, and to look at the development of and the implications of trying to achieve those national bottom lines. So I'll hang, hold, move over to Michael now, who will just take you through the work. Thanks for that, Paul. Uh, yes, so I'm Michael, uh, and I did the review for um, beef and lamb. Um, uh, on the origin uh, and what's needed to achieve the national bottom lines in the NPSFM. Uh, I'll go over in a, just a little bit more detail um, the actual attributes in the NPSFM to start with. Uh, so the NPSFM requires a minimum improvement for a coli uh, and includes national bottom lines for nitrogen, nitrogen phosphorus and visual clarity. Uh, e. coli is a measure of the risk of Campylobacter infection uh, associated with faecal contamination to um, recreators. Uh, visual clarity is a measure of how sediment impacts our ability to see through water. And nitrogen and phosphorus are nutrients that primarily drive plant growth in aquatic environments, uh, though some nitrogen species are also toxic at high concentrations. So the national bottom lines for these attributes set the minimum level at which councils can set targets. Uh, the MPSM also includes a bunch of other attributes, um, but the ones that I just mentioned are the only ones that require uh, regional councils to achieve them through limits. So limits being a rule in a regional plan uh, that sets a land use control, so potentially spatially limiting the extent of an activity, an input control, so an example of that is limiting the amount of uh, fertilizer that can be put on a farm, uh, or an output control, uh, and it, that's generally a uh, limit on the volume concentration or load of a discharge. So through various uh, regional planning processes, beef and lamb um, became aware of how difficult some of these bottom lines can be to achieve. And in response, uh, they commissioned me to answer the question, what do national bottom lines in the NPCVM achieve in terms of environmental outcomes? Uh, and what is required uh, from the sheep and beef sector to achieve them? So in answering that question, I reviewed and interrogated the relevant scientific li literature to describe the compulsory attributes uh, in Appendix 2A of the NPSFM that are relevant to the uh, sheep and beef sector. So those are the attributes that require limits to be set on them. Uh, and then went on to describe the uncertainties in the NPSFM attribute state frameworks that makes their achievement uh, difficult or of questionable environmental benefit. I uh, also looked at the actions on sheep and beef farms required to achieve the national bottom lines in different regions, uh, and also uh, looked at the knowledge gaps that need to be filled to fully understand the effect of the NPCFM uh, on the sheep and beef sector. So importantly, no new modelling was actually conducted for this review. Instead, I relied on the models developed for the 2020 freshwater reforms, including the NPCFM and the stock exclusion regulations. And then this was simply paired with spatial data from the sheep and beef farm survey which is a representative sample survey of approximately 540 randomly selected farms. Now, I considered a range of attributes in the actual report, but to keep today's uh, presentation short, I will only be discussing the sediment as visual clarity and E. coli, uh, as those are the attributes for which I identified substantive issues. Just going through the uh, attributes themselves, um, suspended fire sediment, as I said before, is uh, measured by visual clarity, and visual clarity is the extent to which you can see through water effectively. So the picture on the top right there is a river with very, very, very poor visual clarity, and uh, the guy below it's measuring visual clarity uh, through a uh, clarity tube. Now the national bottom lines, uh, this is about to get technical, but it's not that important. Um, the national bottom lines 
have been set uh, to reflect the modelled visual clarity, at which point the pool probability of capturing six native fish species and brown trout is reduced by 20% compared to the probability of capturing those same fish in pristine rivers. Importantly, the suspended fine sediment attribute state framework was not developed to protect all in-stream biota, particularly sensitive macroinvertebrates, as suggested by the NPCBM narrative attribute states. Now, on this slide, I've put the NPCBM narrative attribute state here on the right to show where the NPSM um, represents the national bottom line to be, which is a high impact of suspended sediment on in-stream biota. Ecological communities are significantly altered and sensitive fish and macroinvertebrate species are lost or at high risk of being lost. Now, honest assessment of what the national bottom line does is protect against a 20% reduction in the probability of capturing upland bully, redfin bully, kawaro, banakokapu, longfin eel, torrent fish, and brown trout, potentially due to the impact of suspended sediment. In addition to not being quite um, what they presented as being in the NPCBM, there's also some significant technical issues um, with the process used to develop the national bottom lines for suspended sediment. Now, this isn't a criticism of the authors of the technical reports behind the national bottom lines. They were simply fulfilling a, a um, you know, work that they were commissioned to do. Uh, they assessed the best option for setting national bottom lines based on the available data and were candid about the limitations of their approach. Um, it's more of a question around should it have been implemented or not at the later stages. Um, but the main issue that comes from the national bottom, uh, that, that arises with the national bottom lines is visual clarity is that they aren't based on a measured relationship between sediment and fish. Um, rather, measured fish data has been paired with modelled visual clarity to establish a relationship. Uh, and in my report, I identify three issues with this approach. Firstly, the model visual clarity data used was for the period between 2012 and 2017. In contrast, fish data, the, the measured fish data went back as far as 1970. Now, implementing restrictive regulation on the basis of stressor response relationships uh, developed from paired data collected over such vastly different timescales would seem pretty questionable to me. It's, I mean, it's not unlike saying that we can predict what visual clarity will be in 2074 based on the fish that we find in a river today. Now, secondly, even if fish and, fish and clarity data were from the same time period, the visual clarity model results are unlikely to accurately re represent visual clarity at the fish sites from which the fish sites were, from which the fish data were collected. So an uncertainty analysis uh, presented in Whitehead 2018 um, suggested a similar model with the same input data uh, with, that was used to develop the suspended fine sediment bottom lines only had a 50% probability of predicting visual clarity uh, at a site to within plus or minus 25% of the measured data. So what this means is that the model used, if it predicts that you're an attribute state B it's for suspended fine sediment, you're just as likely to be an A, C or D. Uh, and finally, the model largely predicts visual clarity based on catchment factors and upstream agricultural land cover. Yeah, agriculture can affect fish populations through a raft of mechanisms other than visual clarity, but these were not treated as confounding factors when the bottom lines were developed. Uh, and this is basically known as the questionable cause fallacy, whereby correlation is treated as causation. And as a consequence of this, the benefits of meeting the visual clarity bottom lines can be expected to vary between and within catchments based on the degree to which suspended sediment currently impacts the fish populations. So in catchments where the only effect of rural development is significantly reduced visual clarity, the benefits to fish may be significant. But in catchments where agriculture uh, is stressing fish through prolific perifighting growth or low summer flows due to over allocation of water, meeting the suspended fine sediment national bottom line may have minimal benefit. And the final, though less important issue with the uh, way the national bottom lines were developed was that the fish attribute that visual clarity was paired for was novel. Uh, it's never been used for any other purpose, and it isn't the same fish attribute that's actually in the NPCP.
so in addition to looking at the background to the suspended fine sediment attribute, I looked at uh, what could be done to achieve them in different parts of the country. Um, and that analysis revealed that in many rivers, uh, the bottom lines may not be achievable um, without significant land use change. And that's not just a result of how they've been developed, but also how they've been implemented. Uh, so the proportion of rivers that cannot meet the national bottom lines is uncertain. Um, but for a bit of context, in 2020, almost 20% 20 of monitored natural state rivers didn't meet them. Uh, also, the modelling that goes into the ANZG water management framework that is commonly used in New Zealand suggests that potentially up to 38% of rivers couldn't meet them if they were reverted back to their natural state. Although the models used when developing the NPSVM indicates that current non-compliance isn't that high. So there's, there is a bit of um, uncertainty around that. Uh, and our land and water also did some modelling recently, which shows that sediment load reductions are needed across 63% of the country to meet the national bottom lines, with 50% of the country needing significant reductions. But that's quite telling, given that 30% of the country is in conservation estate. Uh, and the map that's shown on the right of this slide um, is from that report, uh, and it shows where sediment load reductions are needed to meet the national bottom lines. Um, with the more red areas needing greater reductions. And as you can see, there's a significant amount of the Southern Alps and PCR land needing uh, reductions. And even in the North Island, um, the mountain ranges of the Rematakas, Ruahinis and Tarudos uh, also need reductions. So in terms of what can be done to achieve the national bottom lines, uh, I've also interrogated the modelling done for the development of the previous government's fish rule reforms, uh, and that includes stock exclusion modelling by NEWA and some erosion and control modelling by Landcare Research. Uh, and that modelling shows that widespread stock exclusion, including sheep, uh, is only likely to reduce the number of rivers not meeting the national bottom lines by roughly 25%. Um, and the results of the erosion control modelling suggest that even a 44% of sheep and beef farms were retired, um, plus an additional 8% pole planted with poplars, um, the national bottom lines would only be expected to be met in 54% of the catchments that are currently failing. And it's obviously quite a high level of, achieve, um, of effort to achieve just 50% of what's required by the NPCFM. Now, the E. coli attribute, the issues with it aren't quite as um, compelling as the uh, suspended fine sediment attribute. Um, the current E. coli attribute framework was introduced uh, in the 2017 amendments to the NPS, um, wasn't in 2020, um, and it's largely based off microbial assessment categories which have been used by regional councils for uh, you know, almost 20 years to report on microbial health risk at primary contact recreation sites. The issues with the E. coli attribute um, state framework largely stem from the inclusion of a 95th percentile assessment statistic. Um, without allowing councils to exclude data collected during rainfall or high flows. Now, importantly, that, that 95th percentile assessment statistic, except for the A state, uh, isn't based on Campylobacter infection, like all of the other statistics in the E. coli attribute state framework. Um, and then this is an issue because paired with that, uh, the addition of the 95th percentile statistic, uh, the NPC requires councils to set target attribute states at least one high state higher than baseline states. Now, when the data requirements of the E. coli attribute state are met, the 95th percentile assessment statistic is dictated by just two values, the third and fourth highest E. coli reading um, across the 60 data points. So at sites where storm flow, storm flow concentrations occasionally exceed the 95th percentile concentration of the next attribute state up, concentrations will need to reduce across all flows to achieve the minimum improvement required by the NPS. Uh, now, the problem with this is that while mitigations like stock exclusion may significantly reduce the coal light concentrations during base flows, there is evidence that it's far less effective during rainfall when a coal light enters from the pasture via runoff and when faecal material deposit on the bed um, is redisturbed by uh, the flows in the river. Added to this, people don't tend to swim when it's raining. Now, I know kayakers do, uh, do like to use the rivers in, during high flows. Um, in terms of swimming, that's not when most of the use is, is undertaken. Um, now, that is not to say that mitigation to reduce the coli losses during rainfall isn't important um, or has no value. It definitely is. It's just that there may be limited health, human health benefit in designing mitigations to achieve 
a very specific nine, uh, E. coli concentration during rainfall events. Regarding what can be done to achieve the minimum required by the MPCVM uh, in terms of E. coli, um, stock exclusion by modelling indicates that five metre setbacks uh, on all slope land up to five degrees um, could achieve the improvement in 40% of pastoral rivers. Uh, and that, and that, that is you know, a substantive proportion. Um, however, that degree of stock exclusion goes far beyond what is actually required by the stock exclusion regulations. Uh, and it also leaves 60% of rivers requiring uh, some level of destocking to achieve the, the required target attribute states. Uh, importantly, this isn't just an issue associated with the 95th percentile and um, the E. coli attribute for state framework itself. Uh, some rivers just need massive reductions uh, to achieve uh, attribute state improvement. Specifically, I mean, the, the E band is effectively inf infinite. Um, you can be in the E band and need a 1% improvement to get to the V band, or you can be in the E band and need a 99.999% improvement to get to the um, to the D band. So some of it is an issue with the attribute states themselves, but some of it is just many rivers have very high E. coli concentrations in New Zealand. Uh, so to summarise, the national bottom lines for suspended fine sediment and the minimum improvement required for E. coli uh, will be challenging to meet in many catchments and impossible in others without land use change. Uh, if the bottom lines were robustly developed, these uh, robustly developed thresholds for the onset of significant adverse effects, this would not be much of a problem. I mean, from a technical perspective, the economic challenges would still remain. Uh, however, the review that I've undertaken indicates that, especially for sediment, this isn't the case, and the attribute states are not necessarily robust thresholds for the onset of adverse effects that need to be protected for. Uh, back to you, Paul. Thanks, Michael. So I'm just going to work through um, some of the policy implications around uh, Michael's findings, basically. Hopefully everybody can see that slide. Um, so firstly, we uh, Beef and Lamb took Michael's uh, findings from uh, what he's just shown you, basically around the mitigations and the effect of those mitigations and costed out what that would be for farmers. So retiring 44% of sheep and beef farmland would cost about 3.9 billion per year in lost exports. But that doesn't include the significant up and down stream impacts. So the um, the works, processing plants, um, all the different businesses that supply farms, consultants, et cetera. And there would be hundreds of thousands of rural jobs lost, especially if you have forced retirement to carbon forestry of, of that land. If you looked at stock exclusion with that five metre setback for the extra 30, 13,000 kilometres of rivers and then pole planting 8% of the remaining farm area, that mitigation would cost about $1.4 billion. So as you can see, there's a massive economic, uh, social cost on the rural community from, from trying to implement those mitigations. And importantly, as Michael's shown, in 50% of those catchments not meeting the bottom line presently, you still wouldn't meet the bottom line. So even with all that expenditure. So obviously this has massive policy implications. And I'll just start by saying that freshwater health is extremely important to sheep and beef farmers. They put serious effort into their environmental efforts for waterways. And as Rowena said at the start, beef lamb knowledge that sheep and beef farming affects water quality and um, some of their impacts such as sediment E. coli need to be managed but need to be managed in the right way. However, as shown by this review and the findings that Dr. Greer has just shown you, some of the national policy statement for freshwater management, national bottom lines and the target attribute states are fundamentally flawed and inappropriately calibrated and are not achievable from a technical or economic point of view. And the problem is Councils here are, I think, between a rock and a hard place. So in order to try and meet some of these flawed bottom lines, no matter how unachievable, and councils, regional councils are obliged to do that currently under the MPSFM, councils are left with few responses. They really are between that rock and a hard place, let's say preferably. Regional councils 
need large reductions to meet the national bottom line. Some councils have um, estimated uh, above 50%, some councils going up to 98% reductions and things like sediment to meet some of the bottom lines and some catchments. So to try and meet them, as they have to do, they're proposing some or considering or looking at some very costly intercurrent union rules. So we have rules being looked at, such as no stock on land sloped above 25 degrees. One council, that was about 200,000 hectares. And then also stock exclusion of sheep and cattle. So sheep extra to the normal stock exclusion of cattle from waterways with buffer zones up to 10 metres. And obviously that's incredibly expensive to try and exclude sheep from waterways. Other proposals we've been looking at is all class 70 and 8 land uh, have to be retired in 20 years and planted with carbon forestry and then pole planted on and then pole planting on all 6E land. Others have been looking at stock solution of sheep and cattle from all waterways of very riparian areas. So this is deeply concerning for a number of reasons, not least because for many hill country farms, most or the entire farm would be captured by some of these retirement uh, zones that are being proposed. Proposed, and these farmers would not be able to continue farming. So what do we ask for? Well, it's clear that urgent changes are needed to the MPS FM, given the fundamental flaws with suspended fine sediment attribute and that 95% early coli targets that Michael's talked through and we've worked through. Be clear, Beef and Lamb is committed to improving contact recreation outcomes, but where and when people swim should be targeted first, because it's unachievable to do that in every river all year round at the moment. To be for view is that the simplest way to quickly fix the issue is to remove table eight, spend a fine sediment attribute, and the 95th percentile E. coli attribute state from table nine from the MPSFM. This would just be an interim measure while urgent work is undertaken revising the MPSFM. And look, we understand the pressure regional councils are under, but we strongly urge them to pause applying these national bottom lines and attribute target states until a new fit for purpose framework is in place. So in terms of next steps, so Beef Lamb is continuing its work program of helping farms identify and address their risks to fresh water, such as our extension uh, workshops, our intensive winter grazing workshops, all the extension work we do and the other resources we have available for farmers and the work we do with farmers. We've also commissioned work to try and understand the gaps in knowledge about sediment loss coming from sheep and beef farms and what other information is needed to develop a more appropriate sediment management framework. We do have issues around our knowledge of how effective different mitigations are and what's the best bang for the buck for farmers to be addressing some of these issues. We've also just developed a set of um, fact sheets called Contaminant Loss to Water series. And these help farmers understand the risk to fresh water from their farming operations and the action they can take in place to mitigate or minimize these risks. So in conclusion, Beef and Lamb is committed to working alongside farmers, councils, scientists, catchment groups, other industry bodies and government to collectively build an enduring, robust framework for managing water quality impacts. From our point of view, we consider that this framework needs to be community and catchment based and fully consider environmental, social and financial implications. So thank you very much. And I think now Dr. Greer and myself are happy to answer any questions. Over to you, Rowena. Thanks, Paul, and um, thanks, Michael. Michael, if you want to turn your camera back on, we've got a few questions that have come through, so I'll just um, go through them. And please keep asking questions um, as they come to you, or some of these answers might lead to other ones. So the first one I've got here is um, a comment from somebody who has skimmed the paper. Um, this is what they've written. Skim the paper, and it looks very valuable. Um, is it going to be peer-reviewed and published at all? Um, the challenge will be to get the essence of it across um, for a wider audience. Um, could we use the titles, roles, institutes of the authors on there for ensuring that people understand um, the experience of the people that are doing it? So, um, yeah, I guess the question in there, Michael, uh, for you and for Paul is, has it been peer reviewed and is it going to be published? Do you want to speak to that? Uh, in terms of the peer review, maybe talk to that, um, Michael, because it was reviewed. Yes, um, it was peer reviewed by uh, Dr. Duncan Gray, um, and then I believe uh, Beef and Lamb also sent it out to a number of experts. Uh, maybe Paul can talk more about who exactly read it. I can't remember off the top of my head. Thank you. Um, Ag Research and uh, PC and uh, MFE and, and MPI have been sent it. Yeah, so among, think, amongst others. Yeah, we did seek to share it with quite a lot of um, water quality experts in both the sediment and E. coli area and it's fair to say that um, we didn't get any um, pushback on the 
conclusions that we draw that Michael drew from the report, um, there were no no challenges to that within. Yep. In terms of publishing it, that's a good point. I think at the moment we've just been focused on we did get it peer reviewed and, and getting it out. We'll have a think about whether we need to publish it at all. I think that given the reaction that people have had to it from the discussions that we've had, I'm not sure if we need to, but um, it's a good point. And then the next question is, um, people swim when the sun comes out after heavy rain and they can get sick because of high levels of E. coli. Um, do, you, do you want to just sort of comment a little bit more on that, Michael, about whether people do go swimming um, during those time? And then the second part of the question is, what's your view on the contribution of ducks, geese and swans to, e. coli, to background E. coli levels? Okay, well, I, I can't speak to the general bathing patterns of the with the populace at large, but yet people go swimming when it's sunny. Uh, it's why they, you know, uh, public health warnings often come with a don't rain, don't swim for a couple of days after the rainfall. Um, and they do swim then and they can get sick from higher E. coli concentrations. But I guess the point was that those 95th percentile concentrations aren't controlled. Uh, they're not set to control for a specific health risk themselves. So it is important to reduce the reduce input during those times still but to achieve a, achieve a specific numeric target that isn't linked to Campylobacter infection is of limited value. Um, not that it's not of limited value to reduce your E. coli losses during rainfall to um, reduce the risk of getting sick at all times outside of that. Um, but the other statistics in the NPC Battery um, states do provide significant control over um, human health risk throughout the, the majority of the flow duration curve. Um, you know, the, some of them have an, uh, no more than 10% of the time exceeding 540 um, and so on and so forth. So the other parts of the E. coli attribute do control um, for that. Uh, onto forests, onto ducks and what have you. There's something that constantly comes up um, and ducks can produce an ungodly amount of E. coli Per, per, per bird, they poo 300 and something grams a day, which is incredible. Um, most of the, in most, in my experience, most of the time that people point the finger at ducks, it tends to be a mix. Um, ducks in an, in an intensively farmed catchment might not be as important as what they look like, um, but they can contribute, especially where they're the only ones, and especially when you're in um, uh, wetland type areas. They can produce a, a huge amount and anything down from a pond as well. Thanks. Yeah, and I guess, you know, to sum it up from that E. coli one, it's it's that difficulty of improving one whole band from um, what are post-rain <coughs> events where you've got extremely high levels of E. coli, right? So we're not saying you don't need to manage it. It's just that moving, improving a band from those readings is really difficult, but that's not to say we shouldn't be trying to mm. improve and that the other measurements do that. Um so a question here, how easy is it for you, Michael, a question for you, how easy it for, is for councils to consider natural levels of sediment? Uh, very hard. So the NPSFM does allow councils to factor in naturally occurring processes and set target attribute states below the national bottom line when naturally occurring processes are causing it. I guess the big question is, at what level do you set, it, set the target attribute state then? Some could argue that you are then fully allocated naturally and that there's no headroom for intensification. Some would argue that you would just ignore it and set the target attribute state at baseline. Um, I don't have the answer to that, but it's certainly not as simple as just factoring a naturally occurring processes and the issue goes away. Um, also, when naturally occurring processes get you up to 95% of the national bottom line, there's still 5% that's being driven by um, human causes and again there's a there's an argument to say okay well that's all that's left um i don't have the right answer to that but you know it's not it, it's see i've had a few conversations where it's been argued that it's oh we, we have the flexibility for control controlling for naturally occurring processes but no one actually knows how how to do that and still allow for land use of any sort yeah and i guess our sort of response to some questions when that's come up is that if if you've got up to potentially 38 percent of rivers even if they're in their natural state state not able to meet the nat national bottom line then potentially there's an issue with the actual national bottom line itself um 
So there's a question here. Um, should not the fine sediment attribute be only be an NPS FM action attribute? Michael, I think that's a question for you. Well, I mean, it would be less of a problem if it was. Um, I guess I'd hope that there was robust science behind all of the attributes in the NPCFM, regardless of whether it requires a, whether it's in 2A or 2B. Uh, I mean, 2B still requires regional councils to achieve those target attribute states, and the means by which they'll do that is by rating. Um, so it's not it's a different form of hurt potentially, but there's still a cost being paid. So I still expect them to be robust in wherever they sit in the NPCB. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, Michael. I think I think it's still problematic if it isn't robust, isn't it? I'm, I mean, I, my take home from some of this work is uh, due to that variability within catchments, the complication around understanding natural process and everything else, it does beg the question of whether you can have a national an appropriate national bottom line for spending fine sediment, but we need a lot more work done, I think, to make it a robust process if we do have one. Importantly, this was the best option. This was the best option identified by NEWA for a national bottom line, and, this is, and, we, and we've still got the issues. It, it does speak to the fact that there's potentially a more nuanced approach that's justified for sediment, like we have for nutrient outcomes, where you consider the catchment specific. Um, catchment specific uh, factors in play and also the specific ecological endpoints that you're trying to manage for. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, Paul, this is one for you. Have Beef and Lamb expressed these concerns to MFE? And if so, what was the response, please? Yes, we, we've had numerous discussions of MFE and, and MPI. Um, MFE uh, had a good response in the sense that they, they took it on board <coughs> and they're, they're looking at, at solutions. Um, you know, we, we are where we are, so we have to move forward. Um, it is now with them to advise the, the ministers um, and work through those solutions. We're see meeting with regional councils as well and trying to engage with regional councils to help them look at some of this stuff. Um, I say we're very sympathetic to the bind that regional councils are in, um, and we need to look at solutions on that side as well. Right. And then um, another question for you, Paul. Has beef and land costed a buy what a buyback of land could be if for those that might have to retire? No, no um, but that would be <laughs> that would be very expensive. I, I suppose the starting point that we just said is is having a robust um, robust set of attributes or bottom lines that you can then have those conversations off of, and we're not. Um, I don't consider these ones, uh, the spending fire sediment particularly, is, is robust. Um, undoubtedly, we're going to have, uh, I'll call them hotspots, we're going to have areas that it's, it's very hard to meet some of the outcomes that the community wants and some of those ecological or um, uh, water health outcomes um, without some sort of intervention, um, which might be from uh, central government or local government in terms of things like buyback because they'll just bankrupt farmers you know, farmers have gone through a process over decades if not hundreds of years of getting to where they are um, and even with their best efforts they still won't be able to get anywhere near what might be required in certain areas so that that is another conversation that will have to be addressed at some point I think yeah um, so we've got a question uh, here there's a few people that were clearly watching the Olympics um, in the last few weeks I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this um, I'll put this one to Michael but um Apparently at the Paris Olympic competition, um, the, the you know, as people will know, the triathlon um, was done in the river sign, scene, I didn't pronounce that right, and they used a target for E. coli of 1,000 CFU, which is quite different from the New Zealand national bottom line. And I guess there's questions here about why, why the difference between what they're setting and I guess what New Zealand's ones are. I, I actually did read that they had a target of a thousand, and I wasn't sure if it's because they were using total coliform units, which is E. coli as part of or not. Um, it might just be because they struggle to get to it, and ultimately people still want to swim in rivers, so they have to adjust people's expectations. I mean, the E. coli, e. coli our current targets, they're not based on swim, don't swim. They're based on a risk of infection at each different level. So that we have you know, at contact recreation sites, a target of 540 is based on an acceptable risk and potentially their, their level of acceptable risk is, is just higher than New Zealand's because of the availability of swimming resources and rivers. 
and they will have, would have used a different um, process also to get to their numbers. Um, they wouldn't have used the New Zealand microbial assessment categories to come up with their thresholds either. Yep, thank you. Um, so, Paul, I think this one's for you. Um, will beef and lamb investigate what the current stock exclusion rules, low slope cattle and deer, would do to E. coli and stream erosion and modified <laughs> slash more realistic land retirement and space planting, pot planting? Have we looked into what those current rules might do to mitigate and um, what, change, what reductions, I guess, in uh, in those impacts might be possible if we just um, did those? Yeah, it's that's one of the one of the reasons we're doing more work on um, a commissioned uh, literature review of the mitigation because actually it's fairly unknown the exact. Mm -hmm. Uh, amount. I've been in uh, court cases at the moment that are, uh, there's various numbers bounded around on how much you know, percentage of sediment with different setbacks from different rivers and different slopes you can meet. And we haven't really done a decent um, amount of work on that. Um, so it's still a bit finger in the air. And obviously, there's lots of mitigations that farmers can do. They could put sediment buns in. Um, they prove to be uh, very effective. Rotorua has done a lot of work around that, overland flow and capturing it before it gets to waterways and, and getting sediment, et cetera, out, wetlands, um, edge of field mitigations, capture mitigation. So I think we do need to have a lot of more work done on the cost effectiveness and the the benefit of those mitigations before we just sort of pick some magic bullets. Stock exclusion does seem to be um, one that everybody jumps on, but particularly if you're looking at sheep, it's incredibly expensive. Um, and won't necessarily give you the outcomes you want in certain situations. So I can't really answer that. We just need to do a lot more work around that and look at the catchment profiles and forensics and then work through what the best way of moving forward is. You kind of answered the next question, actually, but I'll just sort of ask it again to say whether have farm sediment retention buns been reviewed like Rotorua? You sort of touched on that a moment ago. Um, I don't think government's done a... a Big review of them from understand. There's been some good work done by um, catchment officers and others in Rotorua on on uh, sediment bonds. And you know, one of the issues we have, we haven't touched on it here, but obviously with climate change, we're going to have the weather patterns change, and we're going to have more extreme weather events. I've had a complete downpour this weekend here. Um, so working out effective mitigations, if there is any in those rainfall events, would be something that needs to be worked on over time as well. But um, yeah, the Rotorua stuff, I think, is something that needs to be investigated more. So um, I think I'll put this question to you, Michael. It's quite a long one, so be with me. Um, it's kind of an extrapolation of the first question around targeting post-rain events. Why are only swimming values considered? Freshwater is owned by the commons and there are hundreds of values that apply to freshwater. State of the environment information is showing us that further intensification of farming in some catchments will exacerbate already degraded catchments. Should existing farmers be protected by halting additional stock in those catchments? Are the target attribute states to blame or are some catchments already really degraded and need a new approach rather than continuing to put additional in into the system? I think there's a... Um... Multitude of issues, multitude of issues covered there that probably separate from um, the E. coli attribute state in itself. So the E. coli attribute state is for human health. That is what it's there for. It's only related to the risk of Campylobacter infection to people using the river for activities with a high risk of ingestion. Um, so that's why that's been honed in on in the rainfall at rainfall times. Um, I think there might be some questions about the pros and cons of grandparenting in there. I, I, I'm, ne I'm nervous to touch on that. I think that's a philosophical <laughs> issue that I probably, probably shouldn't get into here. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I guess it's just, I guess there are, like you say, I think there's a kind of a question about why are only swing values considered and then there's a, a kind of comment around additional N and stuff. And I guess the point should be making that there's, there are E. coli, there's phosphorus, there's sediment, and there's nitrogen limits and rules around all of those contaminants in the national bottom lines in, in different forms. So it's not, yeah, like you say, the E. coli one and the 95th percentile that we've just highlighted a concern about is just one of a whole bunch of different ways to be managing all those different 
yeah. and tax. Yeah. In, in regarding to sediment, I think this is part of this question. The fact that we have such a high level of non-compliance in conservation coming out of conservation estate would suggest that non-compliance isn't necessarily an indicator of significant degradation when you're not complying in, in developed areas. There will be rivers that are hugely degraded that don't meet the national bottom lines as well. Um, but for river class three in particular, um, they've got some pretty strict visual clarity um, standards there that, that, aren't, that aren't met in a lot of places um, where you'd expect them to be if they were a fair representation of, of significant adverse effects. Yeah. Um, and then I think we're nearly to our final question, potentially. I'll just wait to see whether Aaron puts another one up. But um, so another question, or kind of a comment question, uh, representative monitoring is thin on the ground. This is an issue that's been identified by the PCB. Most monitoring sites are lowland. For sediment, how is upstream sediment loss properly accounted for from the land, from stream banks, from stream bed remobilization? Question mark. Um, Michael, do you want to comment on that one? Uh, depending on uh, the national scale model, I don't that that. that I used it in my report and was also went to the MPCM. I don't think that stream bank, that the stream bank, I don't think there was a stream bank component of sediment integrated to it. They locked into it and pulled away from it. Um, I could be wrong on that one. Um, different councils will have different um, different ways they model sediment. Some will account for stream bank erosion and some might not. Uh, in terms of remobilization of sediment, that's already part of the sediment load in the river once it's in there. Um, it's just in bed transport and at least until it's resuspended. So the end point for losses to a river in all models is once it's in there, not how it necessarily moves down once it is in there. Um, so that generally isn't considered to be part of the equation. It's just assumed that at some point that will be resuspended and come out as an impact visual clarity. Yeah, and I guess the question there as well is, is there an issue around being able to measure this and the fact that it is mostly low land where the monitoring sites happen? I mean, the, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is a problem we have as the PCs identified. We we are reliant on a lot of models, um, not just on models, but a plethora of models out there at the moment because we have a lack of, of actual measured data because it's very expensive and hard to do uh, to a decent quality. Um, a lot of catchment groups at the moment have been given significant funding to go out and start doing uh, water quality uh, measurements. And so as they do those over time. Hopefully, if they're done to the right standard, they can be weaved into our knowledge around actual uh, water quality rather than just modelled. Um, because you know those models come with a lot of caveats and um, imperfections and uh, etc. That we need to need to weave in into the policy decisions that aren't necessarily taken into account of. Um, as soon as we get much more measured data, we could probably understand how some of those mitigations and those catchment um, changes uh, uh, of you know retiring land or reforesting or putting into pines or different mitigations actually are affecting water quality. Um, the Fata Fata work, for example, if people should go and look that up, is, there's probably 20 years of Fata Fata work there um, that showed you know some quite interesting results from putting forestry uh, onto dry stockland when actually for decades it's going to get worse for example it's not going to happen everywhere but it just shows there's you know, a lot of um nuance i think around some of the mitigations interactions we have and we need a lot more actual measured data and understanding before we can impose a lot of these things so i've got a few more questions um and we've still got a nine minutes left so um i'll ask i'll keep asking until we run out so um, there's a comment here, it's kind of a comment question. Are streams in their natural state not meeting the bottom line more likely because they're actually modified due to pest damage to the native bush, which then reduces the ability for the forest to absorb, absorb rain and runoff? Given the amount of pest damage to both conservation and farmland, how, how are natural state determined? Michael, do you want to start on that one? I haven't actually looked at the impacts of pests um in the conservation estate, I don't think it's possible to identify um, how the current contribution of feral deer. I mean, there are there are a ton of ton of deer out there at the moment, but I, I imagine if you looked at some, if it was a result of that, just going back 
thinking back to 2000 and when I first started hunting, it was in sort of 2010, 2011. And there are mountains and mountains more deer now than what there were back then. So it'd be, it would be interesting to go look and see what the trend, trend analysis is from those natural state rivers to see if they're, if they are getting worse. It's quite hard to use trend analysis though to pick out specific drivers like that um, to, from, the, from the weather. Yeah. Um, and then there's um, another question here. Can you please comment on the role of wetland restoration and retirement from grazing and measured concentrations of suspended sediment in coli and rivers, particularly in regards to heavy rainfall and in-stream erosion process? I don't know if either of you want to start. So that one, Michael, to start with you and then hand over to Paul. Or... Um, so in the report, I do discuss the benefits of whole of farm plans, which do include, I think, 2% of pasture into wetlands as part of an overall efficacy and that in and other regional and in, in other regional plan processes, they have bundled that up into what has been known as a whole of farm plan, along with riparian planting and retirement and space planting, um, and assumed an overall um, like low reduction factor associated with that. Um, if I was more prepared, I could have had the actual the the, the percent reductions associated with with wetlands. Um, but they are they are quite effective. But they need to be quite large um, to capture. Yes, yeah, so they I think they have to be sized generally to about two percent of pasture area to to work effectively. Um, so they can be effective, but they can also take up a lot of land, especially if you're already being required to give up your hill country. Um, to meet the suspended sediment bottom lines, then to give up your flat country for wetlands is also quite a big, um, a high percentage of remaining land loss. Um, in terms of benefits for a coli, it probably will depend on how many birds are sitting on it um, and the residence times. If it's slow and they're clear and there's a lot of sun on it and no birds, it may well kill a coli. But if you've got a lot of ducks coming and visiting on, it might be a bit of a source for a coli. Um, I recently worked on a wastewater treatment plant um, consent that came out with very, very low coli concentrations out of its storage, into its storage, and then it was modelled coming out was much, 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 much higher. Um, so ultimately a treatment device was increasing in coli. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the new uh, work I saw, the report on that, um, backed that up, Michael, was, yeah, they had 2 to 5% being optimal at least two percent as you say um going up to five going up to five percent um being quite effective but as you say it takes out a fair amount of land you have to have the right topography and everything else to capture capture uh, the water in the right way and it has to be designed properly etc um and while sediment nitrogen uh, phosphorus tends to be quite well um addressed e coli was variable some wetlands they monitored it decreased some wetlands it increased coming back out yeah so I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this question because it probably requires some specific modeling, but um, we'll try. So let's say we have a forest, so we plant, so that 44% of beef and sheep and beef land that needed to be retired was a forested. Could you comment on what the sediment loss might be in difference between har you know, planting and harvesting and, you know, pastoral agriculture is there any kind of being modeling done on on whether that would actually improve or or be a plus or minus overall um so i've read quite a bit on this for various reasons and i there's lots of there's lots of um, studies on various parts of the um, life cycle of plantation forestry but i haven't seen one over a 50 year period yet that looks at your mean sediment loss over the entire lifespan. Um, the general reviews that have come out of land care research have, assess, have assumed a for for, return to forestry of a 70% reduction in sediment losses from pasture compared to 90% when it goes into full native forest. Um, and there's been people who have looked at sediment losses during during and post harvest around a seven year period and then general yields from established forests. But I don't think anyone's successfully stitched that whole thing together to go, how much better is this as a pasture? Is how much, how much worse is it than native forests on a whole of a lifespan thing? And that's something that people are still struggling with. 
yeah, and I think it'll be situation specific, won't mean that going back to that futter futter work when they um admittedly very highly erodible fine soils there. But I think it's eighty years before it gets back to when it was in dry stock from putting plantation forest on it because the the lack of um vegetation on the stream banks, the stream banks have straightened up, etc. So <laughs> some places will be you'll get a good bang for the buck, some places it might actually be worse i think i think one of the things i worry about things like carbon forest and you have long-term retirement without the harvesting is what's going to happen to those you know hundreds of thousands of tons of trees as they start falling over in 50 years time as they potentially will um so Mark, yeah i agree with you michael it's it's we need a quite a wide bit of work done on that and the whole lifestyle don't we i'll ask the last question um what about the impact of koi carp in some catchments on sediment loading? Um, what is the impact? Has, has beef and lamb costed or acknowledged the degradation issue of koi carp and sediment uh, water course controls? We've acknowledged we've acknowledged there is. Um, I think um, again, situation specific. It's one of those things, from my understanding, Michael, uh, jumping some more science around it. That as they churn up the river beds, as they're as they're foraging, that they can be quite significant. Um, contributors to to sediment um be quite a quite a pest um so yeah i think it'd probably be quite hard for some of those um i think of the waikato ones here some of those rivers that have got koi carp and and lakes particularly um to restore them with koi carp there even if all the good work's done on the land by the farmers yeah i'm not sure if they contribute to inputs you know they tend to stir up stuff that are on the mm. That are it's already in yeah. there, but they may damage the banks as well. But man, they make a they do make a, a real mess in terms of visual clarity when they're in there. We're at high numbers if you walk around some of those lowland drains in the Waikato. Um, they can be incredibly turbid, and you'll just see the backs of koi carp just swimming around. You know, it's it's massive, and those rivers should be really clear given the, how low energy they are. Yep. Right. Well, I think we got through nearly all of the questions, and it's just on one o'clock, so. Um, we've used up our allotted hour, but it's great. We had a lot of time for some good questions and answers. Um, so I just wanted to thank you, Michael, and thank you, Paul, for um, <clears throat> your presentations today. And I hope that people that have been on here today have found that, found that helpful and found that useful. If you've got any further questions, please just get in touch with Beef and Lamb. Um, and um, thank you and have a nice rest of your day. <laughs>